Hello and welcome, my G's. It's your boy, Sultan Skinny, scientist of all that's lean and politically unclean. The founding of Baghdad by the Abbasid Caliphate set the stage for a new chapter in Islamic history. Baghdad would not only become the new capital city of the Islamic Empire, but with the establishment of the Bayt al-Hikmah by Caliph Huran al-Rashid, it would also become the international center of learning. Scholars and scientists from all over the world would come to the city in order to study, debate, teach, and translate the discoveries and theories of those before them. What came of this was what many historians like to call the Islamic Golden Age, a period in history when Islamic civilization led the world in literature, science, and technology. Traditionally, this era begins with the founding of the Bayt al-Hikmah and ends with its burning in 1258 CE. While Christian Europe descended into what we call the Dark Ages, the Islamic world, whether it be in Africa, the Middle East, India, or Europe, saw an age of innovation, wealth, and prosperity. But with success does come haters, and the Islamic Golden Age has attracted its fair share of those. Meet Sam Harris an American author, neuroscientist, podcaster, and proud atheist. Sam over here has written a multitude of books and editorials on topics ranging from free will to politics and even spirituality. However, despite his diverse range, Sam is mostly famous for his commentary on religion. Critiquing religion has gotten him quite a bit of attention, most notably his comments on Islam. You see, while Sam has a bone to pick with all faiths, Islam has a special place in his heart, being what he calls the motherlode of bad ideas. Sam Harris thinks Islam is so bad that even the concept, the notion, the suggestion that there was ever such thing as an Islamic golden age is nothing more than pseudo-history. You see, Sam here is a PhD in neuroscience, which means he's very super smart. Much smarter than even I, Sultan Skinny, a cartoon on the internet. So, if we should be listening to anybody regarding the history of the Islamic Golden Age, it should be super smart PhD Sam Harris, right? Well, my friends, we will be doing just that. Instead of your most slimmest host leading the convo, I'm gonna let our boy Sam Harris, in his own words, drop some wisdom about the Muslim Golden Age. Not only will we be learning about the real achievements and contributions of Islamic civilization, but we will also find out just how smart Sam Harris really is. Sam, buddy, tell us what you think about the idea of an Islamic golden age and all of the Muslim-made achievements during this time. I always find it telling when someone is arguing about how important Islamic civilization has been to the career of our species, that preserving the work of Aristotle always appears somewhere near the top of the list. I mean, just think about that for a second. Hmm, yes. Let's think about that for a second, because usually when I think of the Islamic Golden Age, the first thing on my list is the Foundations of Modern Algebra by Al-Kharizmi. But translating Aristotle is good too, I guess. I mean, the only reason we know who this guy is and what he thought is because of Muslims translating and preserving his works. Considering those translations would be crucial to the European Renaissance, I think it's a fair contribution to acknowledge. Aristotle was great. Don't get me wrong, but he's a single non-Muslim philosopher, and he wasn't perfect, right? I mean, he said many things that impeded the progress of science. I think his importance for future generations was primarily as a counterpoint to a thousand years of Abrahamic religious craziness that practically ruined human history, and I count Christianity as the main offender here. You're right, Sam. Aristotle wasn't perfect. He was wrong about a lot of things. Actually, most of the great Greek mathematicians, scientists, and philosophers were wrong about a lot of their theories. In fact, it was during those last 1,000 years of Abrahamic religious craziness, and in particular, Muslim craziness, that Aristotle, along with Ptolemy, Plato, Euclid, and others, would be corrected on their theories and calculations. Now, just because the majority of Christian Europe during this time was suffering under what we call the Dark Ages and relied on the revitalization of Greek works to get out of it, 
doesn't mean that the Abrahamic faiths ruined world history. The Islamic Empire was built on the belief of an Abrahamic faith, and it prospered during this time, hosting tons of great scientists, inventors, and scholars, many of them Christians and Jews. Yes, it is true to say that a millennium ago, the Muslim world was ahead of the Christian West. But that doesn't say anything good about Islam. It's just a reminder of how terrible Christianity was. Uh, I don't know about that, Sam. It kind of does say something when the most prosperous part of Europe during this time was the most Islamic part. You kind of have to wonder why. And while there are many historical factors that we can point to in order to understand this disparity, it is dishonest to say the difference in religion doesn't play a role. One of the reasons the Islamic world was ahead of the Christian West has to do with Islam's strong emphasis on reading and education. The first thing that the angel Gabriel is said to have commanded Muhammad was to read, despite Muhammad being illiterate. Since its inception, Islam has encouraged its followers to read and seek knowledge from other peoples. Promoting literacy among its followers was essential to the Islamic empire's success, as it not only gave people knowledge of Islamic law and spirituality, but it also helped establish Arabic as the official language of such a large and diverse empire. Mosques, as well as being places of worship, were also schools that prioritized the teaching of reading and writing to as many followers as possible. During the Golden Age, Muslims would take education even further and establish madrasas, which were essentially universities before Europe created universities. In fact, many scholars would argue that the concept of the European university took most of its inspiration from madrasas. And as for the ultimate significance of Islamic civilization? Yes, there were Muslims making advances in optics, I think. You think? Dude, they literally wrote the book of optics. They were the first to give a scientific explanation on how rainbows and the human eye worked. Muslims described Herring's law of equal innervation and Snell's law of refraction hundreds of years before the two guys were even born. So, yeah, I think it's safe to say that there were Muslims making advances in optics. But they weren't using these advances to build telescopes and understand the cosmos. Oh, really, Sam? Is that why two-thirds of the stars in the night sky have Arabic names? Is that why the first official observatory has its roots in Baghdad? Like, sure, maybe Muslims didn't invent the telescope, but they were building things like the sextant, the sin quadrant, and more accurate astrolabes. These inventions would be crucial for observing the stars and navigating the seas. So if they weren't using these advances to study the cosmos and other sciencey stuff, what were they using them for? They were using them to design religious calendars and more accurately pinpoint the direction of Mecca. Uh, Sam, I don't know if you knew this, but all calendars are religious. You do realize that our years are based on a religious story, right? Like, we're not in the year 2021 because of some scientific consensus. The only difference between the Muslim calendar and the calendar we use is that we follow the sun and they follow the moon. One isn't more scientific than the other. They're both religious in origin. In fact, a Muslim scientist by the name of Omar Khayyam created a more accurate version of the solar calendar that we use today called the Jalali calendar, meaning that a Muslim made our own religious calendar more scientific. And yeah, they were using these advances to better pinpoint the direction of Mecca. You say this as if improving your maps and world geography isn't a scientific thing to do. I mean, like, this is just basic fact. Here is the basic fact that the Muslim community just has to grapple with. There are single zip codes in New York and Massachusetts that have produced more of enduring value scientifically, artistically, ethically, politically than the entire Muslim world has produced in a thousand years. And if you think that claim is inaccurate or that it contains a shred of bigotry, you are lying to yourself. That's a pretty big statement, Sam. You're saying that there are single addresses in New York City that have produced more value to humanity artistically, scientifically, and pretty much every other lee than the entirety of Islamic civilization. That's a pretty bloated and controversial claim to make, one that can easily be interpreted as bigoted since you are essentially saying that there are single individuals in New York that are more valuable to society than the entire Muslim community. So 
what kind of evidence do you have to back this up? Like, I'm sure you have some sort of study to prove this, and you're not just pulling this out of your... Most of you have heard me mention the, the UN Arab Human Development Report, which revealed that the country of Spain translates more of the world's literature and learning into Spanish each year than the entire Arab world has translated into Arabic since the 9th century. Bruh. Sam. Dude. Did you just cite the 2003 Arab Human Development Report? Not only is this book translation statistic useless in this conversation, as it has nothing to do with the Islamic Golden Age, and more to do with the high illiteracy rates and state censorship in the modern Arab world, but this report actually contradicts everything you're saying. There is an entire section of the article that talks about how significant the Islamic Golden Age was to human knowledge and innovation. In fact, here's one of the quotes from the article that you cited. Indeed, science and its applications became a part of social practice through teaching and research. Scholarship was never marginal in the Islamic Arab city or in the popular culture. It was one of the main attributes of Arab culture even at the time of decline. So this study is not really helping your case here, Sam. So let's, let's try again. What evidence do you have to suggest that the Islamic Golden Age and even Islamic civilization in general produced nothing of significant value. Arabs, are, of course, are only 5% of the world population, but they produce only 1% of the world's books, and a higher percentage of those are religious than anywhere else. Oh, you're pulling stats from the same article that doesn't agree with you. Okay. Still doesn't tell us anything about what we're talking about. You know, for a podcast called Making Sense, you're not making a whole lot of it here. Again, that's just the Arab world. But do you really think that adding Indonesia and Malaysia and Iran to the list would suddenly make Islamic culture look as creative as Western culture? I mean, if you added Iran, Indonesia, and other Muslim countries to the list of annual book publications, then yeah, it would definitely improve how the Arab world looks in terms of its book output. But again, what does this have to do with the Golden Age? And by the way, Sam, like just so we're on the topic, you do realize that Western and Islamic culture isn't a real thing, right? Islam is a religion that has adherence from a variety of different cultures. And Western culture is just as vague and inconsistent a term as Islamic culture. Like, are you seriously going to tell me that Italians have the same culture as Germans? That Spain and Portugal are somehow part of Western civilization despite of having a 700 year long history of being a Muslim state? I mean, these are completely baseless terms you're throwing at me, dog. And what does all of this have to do with creativity? Like, what are you trying to say? That because Arabs don't publish as many books, they're not as creative as Western countries? By that logic, Iranian culture is just as, if not more creative, than French culture. Or indeed as Jewish culture? Wait, what? Let's run these numbers. Muslims outnumber Jews by 100 to 1. We can talk in round numbers here. There are 15 million Jews and 1.5 billion Muslims. In the last 10 years, in the last 100 years, which community has produced more of lasting value to humanity? intellectually, artistically, or in any other way. Yeah, I'm talking about scientific breakthroughs. I'm talking about new businesses and museums and films, cures for diseases, new methods of purifying water, the good stuff. The good stuff beyond beating your wife or forcing her to live in a bag, or killing victims of rape, or performing clitorectomies on girls. You know, the other good stuff. If you are a so-called moderate Muslim or a liberal, who is even now pulling the brakes on this train as it leaves the station, please don't pretend not to know the answer to this question. And don't pretend that answering it, or indeed asking it, is an expression of bigotry. Well, asking the question itself, I don't think is a sign of bigotry. But how you are asking this question is definitely a sign of bigotry. Like, without a doubt. See, Sam, I don't have a problem in saying that the Jewish community was probably the more innovative of the two in the last hundred years. Heck, I'll even give them the last 200 years. You see, when you live in the richest, most educated and prestigious countries of your day, innovation comes pretty easy, just like it did for the Muslims when they were the top powers of the world. This is just the course of history, my guy, and I don't have a problem in saying this. What I do have a problem with is you trying to pivot your way around the question that I'm asking you. 
by making a bunch of loaded xenophobic statements that you insist are not bigoted when they clearly are. This is why you ask for achievements done in the last hundred years when you know very well we are talking about the Islamic Golden Age that happened in the last thousand years. I don't expect Muslims to produce a lot of science when they are being colonized by European powers. This has nothing to do with Muslims being mistreated by the West. The Jews were nearly exterminated in the middle of the 20th century. They were victims of an actual genocide as opposed to the imaginary genocides that we often hear about from Islamist apologists, describing the treatment of the Palestinians, for instance. Who knows how many brilliant and productive people were reduced to ash by the Nazis? Judging from the people who made it out, people who did more to establish our scientific worldview and literature and the arts than probably any other community in modern history, we probably lost some of the most intelligent and creative people who ever lived. Okay, again, Sam, buddy, we are talking about the Islamic Golden Age. You keep trying to come back to events that happened in the last century as if it somehow proves your point. The Holocaust happening doesn't change the fact that the Jews in Europe were still better educated, more prestigious, and wealthier than colonized Muslims. In fact, one of the main reasons the Germans persecuted the Jews was because of the prestige and influence they had in Germany. Resources are a major source of stimulating innovation in a population. And don't kid yourself that this has something to do with the resources either. Kuwait is a small, wealthy country that spends a lot of money on education. It is far below the world average in math and science, like 20% below. What do you think explains this? Oh, for the love of... Sam! What do math scores in Kuwait have to do with what we're talking about? The US has a lower math score than Estonia and Slovenia. These countries aren't leading the world in science and technology like the US is. What does the math score have to do with innovation? In fact, the UAE has a higher general education score than Israel. By your logic, that makes Arab Muslims suddenly smarter than Jewish people. And while we're on the subject of the UAE and the other Gulf states, you need to remember that most of these countries that you're talking about are very new. The UAE is only 50 years old and went from an empty desert to a modern marvel of engineering and architecture. The country is now in the process of creating its own ambitious space program, has made great leaps in AI technology, and has Emirati scientists from all over the world working for companies like Boeing and Toyota. To say all of this has nothing to do with resources is a joke, Sam. Science and technology doesn't come out of countries based on their average math scores. It comes from funding and organization. Your perception of human innovation and history is completely inaccurate. It is not historically inaccurate, nor is it a sign of bigotry, to observe that most of human progress arose in the West. Science is a Western breakthrough. Liberal democracy, the rule of law, equality before the law, freedom of thought and expression, a universal conception of human rights, separation of church and state. These are almost entirely Western inventions, and they are the foundations of almost everything that is good in our world. And when other cultures have adopted these values, like Japan and South Korea, they have flourished. Ah, uh, yes, of course. It all makes sense now, Sam. After all the pivots, irrelevant statistics, and citations that contradict your point, we come to the conclusion that Muslims can't produce anything of value to society because Western civilization has already got that covered. Western civilization, its culture, and people are the foundations of everything good in this world. They created things like liberal democracy, the rule of law, equality under the law, separation of church and state, freedom of expression, and the concept of human rights. So what if all of these things are basically components of liberal democracy in the first place? So what if concepts like the rule of law and human rights were invented before the West was even a thing? That doesn't stop Western civilization from being more valuable than Islamic civilization, right? After all, science, the thing that gives us objective truths about the world and our existence, is a Western breakthrough, right? Well, before we give anybody credit, I think it's important for us to ask what exactly science is. 
The first thing that comes on Google when you type up the word science is the intellectual and practical activity encompassing the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. The Oxford Dictionary defines science as knowledge about the structure and behavior of the natural and physical world based on facts that you can prove, for example, by experiments. So what both of these definitions seem to agree on is that science is more than just making observations about the world. For something to be truly scientific, it needs to be proven using a system of experimentation. You see, human beings have been making observations about the physical world forever, but being able to actually prove and explain how a natural phenomena works is a fairly new concept in the long history of human learning. Aristotle is often credited with being the first scientist due to his method of inductive and deductive reasoning in order to come up with conclusions about the natural world. As revolutionary as this system of learning and observation was to the ancient world, Aristotle, along with all the other great Greek philosophers, could never prove their theories correct. They never conducted experiments or came up with methods to objectively support their claims. All they really did was think about their observations and come up with a logical reason for why and how things work the way they do. As a result of all of this thinking without experimentation, the Greeks hardly ever came to a scientific consensus with their theories. For example, the great philosopher Plato pioneered the theory of emission claiming that light is emitted from the eye like a flashlight in order for us to see. Aristotle, using his reason, came up with intromission theory, stating that the eye is transparent and physical forms of the objects we see enter the eye and interact with our soul. These two theories of vision would become the most prominent explanations for how the human eye functions for most of the ancient and medieval era, being further propagated by people like Ptolemy, Galen, and Euclid. But as popular as these theories were to ancient and medieval academia, the people who championed them were never able to prove them correct. What these early Greek scientists lacked was the scientific method, the procedure of asking and answering scientific questions, using observations and conducting experiments. It is from experimentation and testing one's hypothesis that determines whether or not a discovery or theory is scientific. And since the Greeks did not use such a method to prove their theories, they can't really be called scientists. So who came up with this fancy method that automatically makes things scientific? Well, most people like to credit Sir Francis Bacon with defining the procedure that would eventually serve as the standard for scientific inquiry. But while Francis was the first to write about the scientific method, he wasn't the first to practice it. Not even close. Meet Ibn al haytham better known in the West as al hazen He was born in the Iraqi city of Basra in the 10th century CE. Throughout his career as an astronomer, mathematician, and physicist, Haytham would write as many as 200 books, of which only 55 survive to this day. He would write on topics such as astronomy, medicine, math, philosophy, and a bunch of other stuff. But by far his most famous and most influential work is his book on optics. In his book, Haytham does something that nobody else had ever done before him. He proved the Greek giants wrong. Aristotle, Euclid, Plato, Ptolemy, and everyone else who contributed to the theories of emission and intromission site were all debunked by Ibn al-Haytham, the first person to explain how the eye sees. al Haytham discovered that light bounces off objects in a straight line towards our eyes, allowing us to see the object. Along with that, Haytham also gave us the first correct explanation to binocular vision, pioneered color theory, and would be the first to ever write about Heropoders and Herring's law of innervation. Because of these discoveries, Haytham's book of optics is hailed as being one of the most influential texts in physics. He completely revolutionized how we understand light and vision in far more ways than this video has time for. But Al Haytham's greatest achievement was not what he discovered, but how he discovered. 
Al-Haytham was able to give detailed explanations for how eyes, lenses, and lights work by actually testing out his theories. Al-Haytham went through a procedure of experimentation and observations in order to make conclusions about his discoveries. He controlled his variables and testing environment so that if he conducted an experiment once, he could repeat the same experiment and still get the same results. Not only did this system or method, if you will, allow Al-Haytham to give scientifically correct explanations for all of his theories, but he was also the first person to ever use it. Now, Al-Haytham wasn't the first person to develop the experimental method, no. That credit goes to another Muslim guy named Jabir ibn Hayyan, who is more often than not considered to be the father of chemistry. But Al-Haytham's approach to scientific inquiry was the first to systematically conduct what we now call the scientific method. And by doing so, makes him, Ibn al-Haytham, a Muslim, the first true scientist. So in other words, science, in its very definition and practice, is not a Western breakthrough, but an Islamic one. Furthermore, it's also worth mentioning that all of your favorite European Renaissance and Enlightenment thinkers were heavily influenced by Muslim scholarship. Academia in Europe was for most of its early history entirely a product of the Islamic Golden Age. Not only were nearly all of the Greek works responsible for inspiring the Renaissance translated and preserved by Islamic scholars, but Europeans would also rely on the discoveries and writings of Muslims to further their own science. European chemistry was completely reliant on the discoveries and writings of Ibn Hayyan and Al-Razi, who were the first to create chemicals such as kerosene, sulfuric acid, and pure alcohol, all with applying distillation and experimental methods that are still used to this day. Geometry, trigonometry, and the entire field of mathematics was dominated by the writings of Islamic scholars like Al-Tusi, Omar Khayyam, and Al-Kharizmi, who gave us things like the Law of Sins, the Sachiri Quadrilateral, Algebra, Algorithm, and the now universal Hindu-Arabic number system. Medicine as an academic field is entirely the product of Ibn Sina, whose book The Canon of Medicine served as the fundamental textbook for medical science for over 600 years in Europe alone, giving this man the reputation of being the father of modern medicine. As well as being the father of modern optics, Al-Haytham, along with others like Ibn Baja and Ibn Sal, would revolutionize the field of physics to the point that they would be discussing the theories of gravity, motion, and momentum over 500 years before Isaac Newton was even born. In fact, Newton, along with every other great Enlightenment figure, read and studied the works of Islamic scholars because their entire university curriculum depended on their literature. You see, when Western Europeans have adopted these scientific methods, discoveries, and writings, they have flourished and now continue to carry out the progress of science that Muslims had initiated over 1,000 years ago. So I think it's safe to say here, Sam, that you are incredibly disingenuous about the history and contributions of Islam. Take the focus off Islam for a moment, because this seems to help for some bizarre reason. Consider India, Hindu India. No, Sam, we're not pivoting our way into insulting another religious group. And I'm kind of tired of you dodging the subject and not making any real points. So we're just gonna quickly wrap this up. Here is the basic fact that Sam Harris and his thousands of fans just have to grapple with. Sam Harris is an idiot. He doesn't base his critique of the Islamic Golden Age on historical fact, because if he did, he would have nothing to critique about. His one citation that is supposed to provide evidence in support of his claim not only doesn't prove anything against the Golden Age, but also contradicts everything Sam has been arguing for, leading us to assume that the guy was simply too lazy to read his only source. When he can't think of any other way to support his claim, he relies on his bigotry in trying to make Western and Jewish culture look better than Islamic culture. Not because he has facts to support it, 
but because he himself is Western and Jewish. And it feels good for Sam to tell over 1 billion people that he and his people are inherently superior than they are. At the end of the day, Sam doesn't have any real arguments against the Islamic Golden Age because he doesn't know anything about it. Sam isn't here to inform you about history or science or especially Islam. He is here to sell you a narrative, one that is completely baseless in facts and entirely the product of prejudice and ego. Sam doesn't need evidence to support his claims because he knows that his loyal fan base are lazy just like him and will not take the time to actually look up anything he's saying. In other words, Sam relies on the ignorance of his audience in order to come off as an intellectual. And if you think that what I'm saying is unfair or misrepresents Sam Harris and his fans in any way, you are lying to yourself. Next episode, we explore the dark side of the Islamic Golden Age, unveiling the political upheavals and rivalries that plagued this era of Islamic prosperity. We will see how the Islamic Caliphate continued to be the most advanced and powerful civilization of its day, all while slowly destroying itself. This is the tale of the Three Caliphs.